can't manufacture urgency, and I totally agree with that. But I will tell you what you can manufacture, right? You can be the bridge to figure out what the real thing is that you're solving. You can be the bridge to uncover the latent needs. You can be the bridge to help them understand the true solution. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I've got Ken London with me, and we're going to talk about taking control of the sales process. Uh, By way of introduction, um, Ken is the creator of the Sales Alpha Roadmap and Ken London and Associates, which is a sales consulting firm. He's had extensive sales experience and brings his expertise to consulting, coaching, and training methods. Ken and his team have a proven track record of helping businesses adapt and grow their sales in any market environment. Welcome to the show, Ken. Thanks. I'm fired up to be here. This ought to be a uh, this ought to be a great time because anytime we can talk about getting the world of sales right, we know there's an opportunity to make a difference. So let, let's rock and roll. All right. Well, let's get started. Uh, first, can you tell me? Uh, Tell us about the sales alpha roadmap approach that you use to systematically grow businesses. Great. Yeah. The sales alpha roadmap. So let's first of all, define something. (laughs) Alpha doesn't mean, I know I go to the gym a lot, but that's not what it means. Right. (laughs) Alpha is actually a term that we stole from the investment community, which means a leader or person's ability to contribute above a benchmark. So if your industry is growing at 10, you're growing at 15, you got an alpha of five. So how can we influence things? And so there are a few phases. So like we talk through it and really it goes through and it says, what does a business need to do in order to capitalize on revenues and margins in as most effective manner as possible, which means we're going to the highest price, the highest margin and the highest velocity of our sales growth. And so we've kind of identified three core phases and those are one, we got to get to product market fit, which is our launch phase. Two, we've got to install the process of sales, which so many companies are missing anywhere from you know, 3 million to 500 million. And then the third thing is we have to be able to manage change. And so in that, that's kind of our level flight phase. And so those are the three components that go into really maximizing the growth of any specific business or product service. And I guess, how does that compare to traditional sales processes and, and do traditional sales processes even still work? Yeah, I think it's a, it's actually a, just a different way to identify how we look at the world of growing business, right? And even as an outside salesperson, if you really think about it, if you dial into what your true product market fit is, then you can speak more clearly to the solution you're providing and how it's mapping to things that matter more than kind of the features and benefits. From there, if you kind of identified it, well, you have to have a process. I can tell you, I've interviewed hundreds of outside salespeople, and here's one thing I know. The best, regardless of whether or not they came from a process heavy company, had knew what their sales process was. They knew what their conversion rates were. They knew how they got through it. And so we really have to make sure from a scalability, repeatability, trainable, trainable perspective that we're able to actually put a process in place and then manage that change. I mean, there's, as we sit here today, the world's gone through massive shifts and changes over the last 12, 12 to 18 months, right? How do we manage the changes that are associated with what our prospects look like, et cetera? So, I would actually probably reframe the question. I don't think the question is, does the traditional sales process still work? I think the real question is, does your sales process as a company or a salesperson still fit your buyer? And how, what are some of the best ways that you would measure that? How do you measure if if, uh, your sales process fits your buyer? Yeah, I think the first thing we have to understand is you have to move towards measuring with data as opposed to your gut. And, you know, we've sat in companies and we've had clients from 3 million in revenue to 150 billion. And here's one thing I can tell you that's true amongst most of them. They still run it a lot on gut. And the other thing is they tend to have a lot of the exact same problems. It's just the scale of the problem is harder. And so if you don't know, as an example, what your conversion rates are, what your N is, I'm putting 100 prospects in the top of the funnel and I'm always going to produce 22 sales. If you can't figure those types of things out and what those actual metrics work, you'll have no idea when the world has changed around you. And so whether, let's say that you're a salesperson who's in a a company that may not have those metrics built in, get an Excel spreadsheet out, brother. 
figure that out because you've got to know if I want to reverse engineer into the sales map to my compensation, I better know how many first meetings I need to have if I want to make a certain amount of money. So yeah, sales process, you know, that's one thing. Is it working? Those are the data pieces. And then the other thing you probably got to look at is a map to the way your buyer buys. Because we've had, you know, I had a call with a couple of companies last week and they said, oh, we've got a two-step process, but we're selling to companies to sell between a hundred million and a billion. And I said, okay, that's interesting. You have a process built for a B2C buyer and that's why you're losing all the momentum in the deal because you're showing them a demo, you're sending them a proposal and then you're twiddling your thumbs. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I try to make decisions with data, but uh, also my, my gut tells me that most salespeople underestimate how many first meetings they need to really blow out their number or even make their number. And uh, most sales managers um, underestimate how many sales reps they need in the field to accomplish their, their goals that are being put on them from above, from, from up above. So uh, yeah, that's I, both data and, and gut, I think, are... are, uh, <laughs> are well, yeah, are, every good leader's got a sense of... The, so let's be clear about something, all right? The information you'll get is generally imperfect. So there is a sense of, I got to be able to get through that. I got to be able to figure it out. But let, let's not skip by this, right? You said, I think salespeople generally underestimate the number of first meetings they need. And I think sales managers and leaders underestimate the number of salespeople they need. So we can fix that right now. Okay, I'll tell you how to fix it right now. Get rid of the bloated pipeline and make sure that you have two specific things happening, that you're doing consistent pipeline reviews and that you're getting stuff out because yes or no are great answers. Maybe stinks, right? And the, the second thing is you've got to make sure that your reps know inflating your pipeline and relying on that along with the fact that they're hoping the company will create enough inbound leads for them are not ways to get revenue performers to actually outperform quota. Yeah. Get, getting yeses or nos out of your prospects, not maybes. That Let's, uh, let's pin that on the wall as the first important piece of wisdom dropped on us today. Um, <laughs> yeah, get, get it might be the only one, I got to be honest, so. Hey, if that's, a, if that's all we do is, is uh, go through our bloated pipelines and, and think about who could, I, who could I squeeze a note out of and never talk to again, and never, if I, especially if you're spending a lot of time. I, I actually recommend to companies to have some ways, uh, some way to allow reps to pass a deal back to marketing for just like a value-based drip campaign, just like a way to, you know, hand the baton back and say, hey, these guys aren't ready. I didn't get a didn't get a no out of them. I got a maybe out of them, but the maybe I, I shouldn't be spending a lot of time on it. It should be just like a drip email campaign. You know, I'll, I'll call them, you know, once a year to, to check in because they're, they're a long-term decent play, but I, we shouldn't spend time on these guys. Well, um, that's the social media effect on sales, right? <laughs> the Twittering of the sales process, right? Mm -hmm. We want, here's the, one of the their biggest differences between when we started in sales in the nineties and what we're doing today. Most salespeople, regardless of the length of the pipeline or length of length of their sales cycle, are saying something like, if Johnny at ABC Company isn't interested today, they push him to the side and they kind of stomp on it and make sure they'll never know where it is in the CRM for next time. So what you said was awesome. Let's push them back to marketing. Let's push them into a more aggressive drip campaign. Let's put them somewhere where we can cultivate and warm the relationship instead of just going, ah, they're not gonna buy today. Because unfortunately, we've just kind of gotten to this instant gratification in sales and that's not how you build long-term sales careers. Yeah, our, our marketing team also has like a reactivation campaign that's been really successful. Like they just, hear, you know, once a year, they'll just reach out to everybody and be like, hey, do you wanna do another trial? Because, you know, you wanted this before, it was really cool. You know, remind yeah. them of some of the values and be like, mm -hmm. And if you want, we can let you let you try it out again. And that, and a lot of people are like, "Oh, yeah, I, I really should. I, I've been meaning to deal with this problem. I'll deal with it now. Yeah. If I can get a free trial of it, let's do it." And that's yeah, really, that's, that's why you're growing. That's why you're growing as a company, right? Because one of the most effective campaigns you can run is a closed loss campaign. 
remarket to the people who are in the decision-making process. And if people go, oh, well, no, they, uh, they probably bought from somebody else. Well, no, because about 50% of the time you lost to status quo. So guess what? They're in the exact same seat they were when they looked at you a year later. So oh, for, I, I'd say it's more than 50% for most people. I mean, I, at least in the software industry, because like, you know, every, yep. everyone's already solving all their problems that, they're, that they could solve with software. They're already, you know, the world is spinning before, before things are invented, right? Like we, we could find, we had ways of finding out information before Google. Google just made it easier for, you know, we can search things now. But yeah, everyone has a process for, I mean, doing what we do, right? I mean, people do it in Google Maps, people do it in a spreadsheet. Like they ever, everyone has a way of doing whatever the thing is. And it's not always, they don't need to start doing you today. So especially if you're selling something new or selling something that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, isn't solving like a new bleeding head wound, like, oh, this new piece of legislation came out. And so you have to buy us or our competitors and you have to do it within three months. Like very few people sell stuff like that. For most people, it's more like, hey, that you're you're losing this much every month by not doing this. By every month, like let's figure, let's calculate that. And that, that gives you a reason to do it now and not later. Because so many times it's just, you know, you 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 call someone up two years later and they're like, Yep, we're still doing this by hand. And you're like, dude, <laughs> like didn't didn't we didn't we calculate that you this would pay for itself in a, in two months? Like, how are you still doing this by hand two years later? But what do you think? So let me ask you a question. Then, what do you think then is the reason um, that the status quo wins so frequently? I think that uh, that people. I think the, it's a very distracting world right now. I think the average buyer is just getting so many data points. It's a very noisy world right now, and I think that uh, everybody has more on their plates than they used to. We've you know, since, since my career started, the consultants have told us to, you know, the, the management consultants have told us to squeeze, how to squeeze more value out of every employee. But one thing that's happened in that process, I think, is that people have gone from like finishing their work at by 5 p.m. every day and really kind of being on top of their task list to having like a ghost task list of like things that would have a positive net present value for their business if the project was executed but it's 50 things long. Like if you talk to the average VP of sales, you're like, oh, what's on your to-do list? They're like, oh, you mean my real to-do list? This one over here, it's got 200 things on it. And I'm only going to get done the first 10, like, and things jump right. in all- In the next like, six months. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, then you know, six months later, I can do the next 10, but, but things jump in and buyers start and jump in front of things. So if you're not, if you're not in that first like five or 10, you're just not going to get done. And so you really have to, um, so many things are like, they're, they're, you know, this would make us 10% better. This would make us 5% better. This would make us 2% better. So many things are little projects that uh, just, you know, they, 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 fall, they fall to the wayside next to the, the things that are burning, burning bonfires that need to get done like this week or, or the world comes to an end. Can I give you my, my answer to that, which is slightly? Yeah, different. yeah, totally. So, so first of all, let me say I love John Barros and, and John... I've seen his posts and he says, you know, you can't manufacture urgency. And I totally agree with that. But I will tell you what you can manufacture, right? You can be the bridge to figure out what the real thing is that you're solving. You can be the bridge to uncover the latent needs. You can be the bridge to help them understand the true solution. And you did it even there in a little bit of what you're talking about. You talked a lot about, hey, ROI and numbers. Now, as executive leader of a company, that might be the way that you just like to make your decisions. I can tell you the people down the chain, though, you've got to remember that you have to get, how will it emotionally help them? So what's your champions win, right? What's the larger problem you solve? So as an example, you know, people don't wake up and say, hey, I want to spend 50,000 bucks on better reporting from software. That sounds like an awesome way to spend my cash. <laughs> you know, what they do say, though, is, right? I'll spend 50,000 bucks every day of the year if it helps me run my business more effectively in these areas, blah, 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 right? And so I think too often now, and I think as sales leadership and ownership, we've made a mistake. We've allowed people with companies like, and Zoom Info is fantastic, and there's all these things out there, but we've allowed them to get so much into trying to drive, hey, here's our ROI, and this is what we think it is. Instead of pulling that out of somebody and speaking to a larger strategic business problem, that they have. 
And so if you don't mind, like, let me give you a one opener to an agenda that opens mm-hmm. up the strategic conversation. Absolutely. So say if you're in a discovery call, right? Hopefully outside sales, y'all are doing some discovery calls. And if you're a sales leader, I hope they're doing a lot of them. Um, so hopefully they're doing some discovery calls. And so one of the things we like to do is we like to kind of target timing. And so in our perfect meeting format, we'll say, okay, what's your agenda look like? And it might look something like this. Hey, I'm really glad that we could find some time today um, where we could get together and connect. Do you mind if I propose an agenda? And then here's the crux. What I'd love to do today is learn more about what's important to you over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, what you're focused on, sprinkle in a little bit about us. And at the end of this thing, we'll decide whether or not it makes sense to have another conversation. Look what I did there though. I took their eyes up off of the desk by time framing it. Because if I come to you today and I go, what's going on in your world? Oh, my kids just called me. My wife did this. I'm working from home. My child peed on the wall behind me in a Zoom. <laughs> so, you know, that's a quick way into discovery. Because I say you don't have a closing problem. You got a value development problem. So time frame your request like that. And I can tell you right now, if they take that tactic, they'll start winning. I love it. Uh, that's that's fantastic. And how, how do you how do you tailor that? How, is it important to tailor your sales approach to each customer and, and, and instead of adopting like a one size fits all approach, how do you take, how do you take that base and, and customize it? Yeah, ultimately I believe frameworks matter the most, right? So 75% or so, which is a made up statistic, like 92% of them. <laughs> so it's a made up staff, but see, I was waiting to see if anyone left. So hopefully somebody in their car did. But so 75% of it's about the framework, right? So like our perfect meeting format has six steps. But within that, once you understand the framework, you can actually use your own, your own dialect, the your industry. But there are basic premises of the best practices, like time boxing, you know, a lower time for somebody who's lower down the time pole. And as a CEO, I can say, what do you think about three to five years? But I couldn't say that to the person running copies for you that's an intern. So time boxing, that stuff makes sense. So you can change the, you can change the words. You can't change the intent because guess what? It's not reproducible. And then if it's not working, we can't look at it and hypothesize about where to make a change, make a change and see if it actually made an impact. So I think from a sales process perspective, yep, there's one great framework so that we can actually make changes when appropriate. And tell me, how do you think a, a salesperson can can bring value from the real world into their sales conversations and deals in order to close more? How, how, can, they, uh, how, how can they bridge that gap from the theoretical to the real? Yeah, the, the number one way is to, is to understand what's happening in and around the industries that you sell to. So I'll give you an example. So we have a lot of clients in the technology space. COVID has made a significant dent in the availability and the pricing of software engineers. (laughs) You would probably know that as well as anybody right now, right? I do. Yeah, it's very true. (laughs) So, but the question is, so if I'm selling software engineering services to anyone, how do I bring that value and show them? Well, hey, I know that you are generally, you could be one of the biggest technology companies in the world. But how are you handling the changes in today's environment? Because the demand on software engineers means you're paying more for a lower quality of people because you know what? All these industries that never cared about mobile app development or never cared about software engineering were forced into it in the last 15 months. And they're hiring away all the talent when you already had a shortage. The reason, and that makes it, oh, okay. But that's so valuable because it frames That's going to help frame my pricing later, right? There's a shortage of qualified people. Frames my pricing. It sets the table and it starts a conversation that goes down the road. Hey, how are you handling this problem? And it says, I see the real world and the impact that it's having on your on your company and the companies like you. Yeah, it's so important to recognize how how your your the questions and the the establishing of, of what the value of the service is with the customer early on um, helps helps you do well in your negotiations and keep price high and 
and later in the, like as you close the sales cycle like there's a there's such a such a bridge to be able to, to be able to win in your final negotiations be able to point back to well we, we, we figured out that this is going to save you a hundred thousand dollars a month so since it only costs twenty thousand dollars a month you know it's kind of like why are you jamming me on trying to get that trying to get me down to 17 right <laughs> like, yeah 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 because anyway, yeah. you don't want to wait you don't want to waste one more month you know bickering about the the nickels and dimes here when when you're losing you know 80 grand a month by not doing this yeah and you'll see that happen a lot and what you're finding there is that's usually a value development problem right they put you on a set you have five other people you're competing with you're at the top of an excel strategy they're just clicking off features and they're going, hey, these five vendors or three vendors or two vendors, they have all the check marks. So let's just see who's cheaper. Right. And that's and that's because like Gartner says, I think the number 74 percent of buyers actually 74 percent of buyers want value in the sales process. Yet only 47 percent feel like they gain value from their salesperson in the sales process. So true. So those are, you know, those are when you start to think about if you plug into the idea, you know, ask yourself as a sales leader or manager or CEO, whatever. Hey, if I sat through a process, if I sat through the sales process with my team, A, would I feel like they brought value? B, would I get tired of the process at some point? And C, would I even consider buying? Remove yourself from the fact that you think you got the greatest product in the world and talk about what the buyer's experiencing who doesn't know you from anyone else. And for people that really want to control everything, you know, a lot of people, I think, yeah. uh, really focus on controlling the whole sales process, which is, you know, and I think that some areas are controllable and other areas are less controllable. How can a salesperson figure out what they should focus on controlling and what they have to let go? How about this? I'm going to make this the easiest answer I've given all day. Okay. The easiest answer is this. You control the things that are controllable. Salespeople, right? Like, here's the problem with salespeople. I'm going to make a million dollars. And then tomorrow I'm like, I'm sure I'm going to be fired. And control the things you can control. If you're sitting around, you know, if, if you're worried about what your software engineer is doing or your manager is doing or whatever, like you've got to control the things you can. And so when somebody says to you, Hey, how's your pipeline? And it's weak, make a phone call, send an email, get a referral, have a meeting, right? Put your effort into only things you can control and don't invest any emotional energy into the stuff that you ultimately can't, but you wish was different. Yeah. We, and you mentioned John, John Barrows earlier saying, you know, the, that ur urgency, you can't control urgency. And, and I think, just also timing is related to that. Timing is extremely difficult to control as a salesperson. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, when I, when I was carrying a bag, my, my VP of sales pounding the table, you know, is, it, is this deal going to come in by the end of the year? And it's like, well, I mean, obviously I'm doing everything I can to get the deal to come in by the end of the year, but ultimately yeah. this, you know, these guys have to sign on the dotted line. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it is not that that piece is not highly in my control. The timing isn't right. We've got it where we will win. The, I, I'm confident we will win this deal. Will we win it by December 31st? Ah, that's tougher. That's tougher for me to say for sure. Like they, they, they're not quite ready. We're trying to hurry it along, but they're not yeah. ready. John and I agree on one on, on another thing. We agree on uh, because unless his opinions changed since we talked a couple of years ago about this, uh, but we agree on another thing that the way that we measure quotas and such We've taught our buyers to wait for the discount. Yeah, well, especially in the software industry. Thanks, Oracle, yeah. for training everyone that, uh, <laughs> thanks for multiplying your price by five and then t training everyone that you can uh, divide it, <laughs> get an 80% discount. Because that's, that's, <laughs> that, was a, that was a great business model you created. <laughs> like, <that's> not, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times people will be like, well, let's, you know, we, we got a discount like this from like Oracle or other vendors. I'm like, yeah, that's not. That's because they they just multiplied. I could do the same thing. I could multiply my price by five and then give you an eighty percent discount. But that doesn't. But uh, you know, it's it's uh, that's definitely a um, that we a lot in certain industries. I think that has been trained and and coached and and in certain cultures too. You have to be aware of what culture and what country you're selling into, right? Like there yeah, are sure. there are places where if they don't get a forty percent discount, they just feel like you're ripping them off, and they and and their whole all the prices in their whole, in their whole country are, are grossed up. 
you know um, yeah and you, and you see that happen a lot and you'll see that happen certainly over the seas from the u.s where we are and um it's all the things we're talking about like if you do better value development all this stuff kind of strings together you know ultimately you end up in a position where price matters less mm-hmm you know, yeah. and so that's, you want to talk about why should you actually understand sales process, sales, why you should get through this stuff, why you should be a master of the craft. You're going to get less pushback when you're trying to get a deal done. And then when you talk about the thing we've talked about, like, hey, they're all waiting for March 31st to actually get the discount because the salesperson is going to come in and go, can you help me out? I, I, I need to close this. Right. You're going to get the mm-hmm. salesperson doing that. And instead, like if you're a sales leader, teach them this, teach them to flip the calendar. And so we say flipping the calendar is when you could take a measurement of any calendar time. It could be January, it could be the first quarter calendar wise, or it could be February through April, or it could be March through June. And in any 90 day period, you're at or above quota, right? So teach your sales teams that instead of teaching them, hey, why don't you get about you know 28% to 50% of your pipeline closed in the final week of the quarter, where we all create a bunch of stress and then you don't do anything for the next two weeks of the next quarter because you're worn out. Yeah. I, I've, I've been very careful to not care about quota or like quarters and, and what gets pulled into this quarter versus next quarter. I don't put any pressure on the sales team like that. I, I you know, every month's a new month and, uh, and, and I, and I don't play the quarter game because, and, and granted, you know, I'm not a public company, so I don't have to, right. It's a, it's yeah. a private company, but, so I guess, you know, if I, if I was public, I would have to. And I, and I remember, I've, you know, or, or when, when, as I was at Google, when quarterly performance became more and more important and they kind of shifted away from being like, well, we just print money, who cares to, oh, the public markets will punish us for not behaving on yeah. the quarter. Oh, we didn't realize that. <laughs> right? so. Well, if, look, the other problem that creates, right, too, what are we doing? We're always measuring the grade instead of the homework or the test. Right. Right. Did you hit quota? Did you perform quota? Instead of going, did you have enough first meetings? Do you have things progressing through your pipeline in a timely manner? Like measure the front stuff and the back stuff happens. Yeah. Honestly, we just, as leaders, we just got to be better. And how, how would you recommend that, that a leader helps their sales team, um, helps their sales reps focus on the parts of the sales process that are really important? How do you, uh, or if you were a rep, how, how do you focus on the, the parts of your sales process that are the most important? Yeah, I like to think about it from a left to right perspective, like literally the same way you read. And so you focus on the, like when you don't know where you're at, you just start at the beginning, right? And you go, hey, can I do a really strong discovery call? Because I'm going to get more shots at discovery calls than I am at putting MSAs out, right? So if I get better on the front end, and so there's some stats out there in software as an example that say, um, high and, and, and teams. just to de- define things for the group, MSA is, uh, uh, what does that stand for? Service agreements? What MSA? Yeah, what is that? Oh, master service contracts. Right. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So you're going to do more of that than putting contracts out, right? Because that's way down the pipeline. You've thinned it out. I apologize. Yeah, it was an acronym. So, <laughs> no um, worries, no worries. So you'd rather do, so if I can get really good at the front of the pipeline, right? And so in software, as an example, just because we've talked about it a couple of times as an industry, there are some statistics that say um, the really good sales teams convert 50 to 60% of their discovery calls into opportunities. Okay. And so that's a really solid number. But if you go back and look, go back to data instead of gut, right? If you go back and look, most teams are probably, that's really good teams. Most teams are probably converting at probably somewhere between say 20 and 30. I mean, so that can be a double of the number of opportunities in your pipeline. So that's the place that you look first for an impact, right? And then you continue to move through. And I think the front two paths, that and kind of what we call a value demonstration are the front kind of sections, depending on the company, where you can make the biggest impact across the opportunity pipe. So if you're a manager, lean into those. That's where value development starts. That's where you get more opportunities. That's where you get less pricing pressure on a longer term in the pipeline. And what about, um... What about distractions? I feel like dist- being distracted is such a challenge right now um, with how busy the world is and also where we are with, uh, you know, coming out of COVID here. Um, what, what, what would you say your top tips for being, beating distract- distractions and staying focused are? Yeah, number one, control what you can control. Number two, create a solid operating rhythm. Create a rhythm that you know I'm doing X, Y, and Z 
And more importantly than just creating it, make sure that those around you understand it, especially when you're at home. When you're in outside sales, I hope people are still here listening because when you're in outside sales, here's the gig. All of a sudden, if you're not on the phone, your family doesn't think you're working. They have to understand how you're operating rhythm works too. So those are probably the top two things. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I, I think there's uh, there's been a lot of challenges with people working from home and in the sales role because uh, they it's it's an easy job to distract. It's like oh, you're just doing emails right now. It's like oh, this is the this is the job though. You know, it's like this is a, you're, oh, you're just you're just researching companies right now. I can I can talk to you. It's like no no, I'm, I'm really busy right now. This is this is kind of what I do. Yeah, this, um, this is the part that contributes to twenty percent of my earnings. So mm-hmm. let me let me be. Yeah, and. How do you ensure that you're in the driver's seat on a deal instead of, you know, being a passenger in your prospect's car? How do you, how do you, why is that important? And how do you make sure you control the sales cycle? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that we do at the end of the, like our perfect meeting format. And that is one. So we want to book end the back end, which is bring the customer back to the value that they stated that they're going to receive from that. We always do a prescriptive next step. And so by prescribing the next step based upon what they're going to receive for value, you do, you can do a fantastic job because you're being client centric and you can move forward. So you can control the flow of the sales process, keep clients engaged for longer. And so I would say that it's kind of, you know, it's everybody's heard set the meeting in the meeting, but the way that you're able to do that is by bookending and bringing them back to value. And then by taking that and turning that into a prescription so that you, Mr. Client, can receive X, Y benefit, I recommend this. All right. Well, next section is sales in 60 seconds and um, quick questions, quick answers. So tell me, what's your top tip for having that laser focused sales approach for someone who doesn't feel they're as focused as they could be? Yeah. Under, understand, understand your sales process. Stay client, stay client centric and prescribe next steps based on what's in the best impact for the client. Great. And as a sales trainer, what's one of the most common mistakes you see salespeople make that causes them to lose deals? Um, they underestimate the, the, they underestimate the sheer value of helping expose the bigger need they help cure. They assume they're going to tie the features of their product to the benefits that they believe the client needs. Because is it more important that I know it or is it more important the client says it to me and then I can align to it, get them to say it to you and then align the impact you're going to make around their strategic goals. Yeah. Kind of the classic, this is what we're going to do for you, you know, features, and that's going to give you these benefits, which is worth this value in dollar terms to you kind of, and, and coming to agreement on that value piece is, is so important to success. Yeah. Get them to say it and use my hack, which is so that. So the hack is state what you think they're going to state what you think you're going to do with them so that they receive this benefit. Go to sew that in there. It'll always work out. Two little words. So powerful. (laughs) Um, So do do you have any habits or routines that you'd like to share with everybody that you think would be helpful to field salespeople that, that you use to increase your productivity? Yeah, I have two of them specifically. I have something called the three foot rule. Put your arms out, pretend like that draws a circle around your body. And then if, it, if anything that you're worried about, anything in your world doesn't actually physically come in that circle, I use it or figuratively, I use that to represent the idea of control only what I can control. So it doesn't come into the circle where I can literally touch and change it. I put no emotional energy into it, which means I'm on my game more often than most. Yeah. Right. So I think that's the first one. And then the second one is find a way to de-stress outside of work. For me, it's the gym, it's fitness. You have to have a, an, an equal balance. I don't care if it's the gym. I don't care what it is. You've got to find a way where you get moving and you have some sort of life out of outside sales, because honestly, outside sales can be over-consuming and you can be in that thing and work 18 hours a day for three months before you know you actually did it. Absolutely. I, I love the con the, the you keep coming back to control what you can control, forget about the other stuff. I feel like it's such a distracting world right now. And so many people are distracted by all the things. I mean, the, the internet is endless. YouTube has billions and billions of hours of things to watch. And, and, and I feel like there, it's, 
it's enabled the people to have an interest that they and passions that they didn't have 10 years ago. Like I feel like a lot more people were able to be more focused um, yeah. 10 years ago than they are today. Uh, it's like Reddit, it has no bottom. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely not a bottom. At least there used to be an end to all the bound books. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what would you say is your greatest sales lesson that you've learned over the years that you think would be helpful for outside salespeople? Yeah, probably the number one thing I can say, it was at the end of owning my first business, which I ultimately ended up filing bankruptcy from. And what I ended up doing is it was uh, the end of 2008, 2009, it's 2009 and a half, 2010. And I decided to diversify the product set that we were carrying for our clients. Um, rather than doubling down and making the message incredibly simple so people understood exactly the solution we were solving. So the number one sales lesson I've learned, and it cost me a bankruptcy and all sorts of other stuff, was that idea of don't get enamored with all the shiny objects around you. Simplify, because if you can't speak why your product or service solves somebody's problem in fifth grade language, you don't have a command of actually what it is you do for them. So what's one thing that you teach in every tr sales training that you do? Um, in every sales training that we do, there's a, you know, there's a lot of concepts, but probably the number one thing that we're teaching are the things that are related to value development and how to expose latent pain, right? We're trying to get, I need to be able to walk you through, you know, if I go to the doctor and I say, hey doc, my back hurts. And he says, get up off the table and walk to the door for me. And I get up off and he turns around and he says, man, you don't have a back problem. It's because your right knee screwed up, right? In this internet age with seven, the, you know, the stats saying 70% of people come two thirds of the way down the thing or whatever they say about how educated they are. If you're riding around in your car, sitting in your home, raise your hand if you agree that buyers are usually wrong about what they want you to cure. We got to stand up as salespeople, help them understand that we solve a bigger problem. Yeah. Well, and, and as long as we're on the topic, um, you know, I, I know you, you, you teach a ton of sales trainings and you have a really interesting philosophy that I, I think is worth talking about to the group. T tell, tell me about what's unique about uh, your sales um, training program and, and, and the philosophy that's, uh, that's a little different about than, than some other ones. Yeah, we, we've got a philosophy that says the following, that the sales training and consulting industry is broken. Um, you know, you've all been a part of it. You've either bought it or you've given it or you've been there. And it's not, it has nothing to do with the quality of the sales trainer. That you've had the two day thing, you flew in, you did whatever. But the Effingham forgetting curve says that you forget 77% of what you learned inside of seven days. And so when it comes to sales training and consulting, we sell the services traditionally the way that we'd never tell a, a buyer, uh, one of our say companies to actually sell. It's about our product. It's not about what we do for you. And so what we've done is we've created a program that says in any environment, you may need strategy help, process help, training, coaching, et cetera. And so with that, if you only address one, fix my sales team, fix my process, and you don't do little micro sized bites to help habit stack what you're doing so that that team can actually have behavior change because that's the miss. We need to get behavior change in order to make things stick and improve things for our companies and our people. It's like, you know, changing one wheel on a car with four flat tires. You got one, but it's still a pretty bumpy ride. And so that's how we want to market with that, where every single month we're working with people and we're doing small trainings backed up by coaching with sales strategy and process work so we can help with the entire go-to-market strategy. Yeah, I, mean, I think we've all, we've all tried to learn things or make change either on our team or ourselves, but it's, it's so hard if you're not able to actually make it a habit and yeah, I think it's fantastic. You guys have kind of focused in on how to how to habit stack and how to how to uh, actually make those changes stick. That that's really and because that's that's why we that's why we try to learn things in the first place. Uh, the the uh, the the whole Effingham forgetting curve, seventy seven percent in, in seven days is it, it's a crazy stat that you bring up. And 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 this isn't the only place I don't think that it's important for salespeople to think about that. Like that's just a that's just the thing that humans do. We, we, it's in one ear and out the other for, for the most part. And I think that as a salesperson, 
that makes follow up and, and following up with value and following up to remind them why it was important it is is so important. I and mean, we, we yeah, we, we think we're such clever little monkeys, but really we forget everything that happens. So maybe we're maybe we're not as clever as we'd like to think. <laughs> yeah, and we're still primates, right? We still you know, we still focus on the thing. We want to focus on food, we want to focus on the basics in life. And you know, here's the the behavior change component of, of what what is supposed to be done to help companies systematically and predictably grow sales is the missing part because Here's what's hard about it. You have to tell them how to do it. Then you have to coach them. Then you have to inspect them. And most of the time, we just assume they get it, right? We don't tell them, how do you do it? How do you make the change? How do you go forward? And so, yeah, behavior change, you know, I got to tell you, I mean, understand that with every part of your organization from customer success to sales to engineering, um, understand that telling them once isn't going to make it happen. And if you could give a piece of advice on one actionable takeaway, what is the first thing that the field salespeople listening today should do as a first step to take control of their sales process? Yeah, get better at communicating with people because if you're a master, we always say the best communicators win the best deals. Become better, practice that internally with your manager, practice that internally with your peers. Focus on the idea of becoming a communicator that person who you'd meet at a restaurant or a bar who sounds natural and conversational, that's probably you. But you need to sound that way on a call too. Have the right purpose and those things will come easier. Great advice. Well, I'm going to try to summarize everything you've told us today here, Ken. Uh, but uh, it's going to be tricky. There's been a lot of knowledge dropped. So uh, first, Ken taught us that um, you maximize your business growth by following these three steps. First, you dial in your product market fit so that you can speak clearer about your value to, that you provide to your customers. Second, you create a streamlined process so that you can really scale your sales team. And third, you manage the change so that you can adjust, adjust to all the shifts in the market. You're not, you know, measuring the exact changes then you don't know that the world has shifted around you, right? Um, you want to run a, clo run a closed loss campaign to retarget people who were, were further along in the buying process but haven't yet bought. Uh, that's a great way to uncover those people and, and get them reengaged. Uh, you can time frame your discovery requests and then your prospects will start paying attention to the value that you're providing and, and can give a really nice way of, of, of how to lay that out, how to kind of, you know, uh, bucketize the, the amount of time, the timeline. Um, you want to use frameworks to guide your intent and then adapt the wording in your pitches to be personal to you and your customers. Frameworks are so important. Salespeople need to know a lot about the industries they sell to. They need to be experts in them. And then given that expertise, you can frame the unique value that you can provide. You can help them count it up. You can help them predict it. As a sales manager, stand back and ask, if I sat in on a sales call with one of my salespeople, would I gain value? Would I get tired of their pitch? Would I buy the product? Um, you know, I always say hire sales reps that you, in the interview process, you, you think to yourself, yeah, I would buy things from this person. Like think about what you buy and, and ask yourself, would I buy things from this person? It's one of my, my favorite sales, sales rep ha uh, hiring hacks. At the end of each sales meeting, you want to bring the customer back to the value and prescribe a next step to them. So set up, set up what's going to happen next and make sure that they're thinking about the value of, of what you're providing. So much great information and knowledge you taught us today, Ken. Where, where can our listeners read more about your work? What's the best way to get to know you better? Reach out to you. Yeah, probably the two best ways are, uh, say three best ways. Go to the website, kenlundin.com, which is L-U-N-D-I-N, so that's .com. And then second, please hook up with me on LinkedIn. Let me know you let me know you saw or you listened to the Outside Sales Talk podcast. 
when people do that, you want to talk about your business, we'll give you a free strategic kind of conversation for 30 minutes, not trying to sell you anything because heck, we don't even know you. Um, and then hook up with me from a standpoint, you can follow us on Twitter and everywhere else. Um, we're all over social, but yeah, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are. And if you think we're wrong, tell me. Awesome. Well, people should take you up on that. Uh, Ken, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If anyone out there works in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps. The number one route planner helps you sell 20% more and drive 20% less. You can get a free trial at badgermapping.com today. And if anyone can think of other sales reps, sales managers that would benefit from the stuff that Ken taught us today, definitely uh, forward this episode on to them. Ken, thanks so much for being here. It's been, uh, it's been awesome. It's been awesome. Appreciate you. Take care until next time, everybody.